Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Quite a beginning <laughs> to a letter. And we have to remember that it is a letter, not a book or a sermon. It's a letter written by a certain person to other people and when we read any of Paul's letters, or any of the letters in the New Testament, we need to ask ourselves who wrote it, who is it written to, and why was it written? What problems was it dealing with? What questions was it answering? Well, the first question is very easy to answer. It was Paul who wrote it. And we're going to hear more about Paul uh, for the rest of the first two chapters. But Paul wrote this letter, and he wrote it to the churches in Galatia. Now, Paul had been uh, commissioned by the church in Antioch to go with Barnabas to preach the gospel of the grace of Christ. And first of all, they went to Cyprus, and then they went across the sea to southern Galatia, which is today modern Turkey. And the first town they went to was a Pisidian Antioch, another Antioch, I'm afraid. We've got several new castles and all sorts of things. But he went to Pisidian Antioch. And he went, first of all, to the synagogue. And Luke in Acts gives us, I think, a sample of the sort of sermon he preached everywhere. And he started with the Old Testament, with God's promises to Abraham and to David. And he ended up always with preaching about Jesus his death on the cross, and his resurrection. And that through this, through Jesus and his death on the cross, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from everything that they couldn't be justified from by the law of Moses. And there was opposition from some to his message, though many believed, uh, and they were expelled from that city. Then he went to Iconium, and the message there was confirmed by many signs and wonders. And again, there was opposition. There was a plot to stone him and Barnabas, and so they fled. And they went to Lystra, where Paul healed a lame man miraculously, and the people began to think they were gods. Uh, and Paul had to say, no, 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 I'm just a man like you. And then he preached the gospel to them. And then, unfortunately, the Jews who had rejected the message in Antioch and Iconium had followed him to Lystra, and they stoned Paul and left him for dead. But God raised him up, and he was not daunted. He went on to Derby and started a church there. So he'd started these four churches in the region of Galatia. Then he went back through them, even though he'd been persecuted and stoned in these places. He went back to Lystra, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch. And he went and visited the believers in each of those places, 
strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to stay true to the faith. And he and Barnabas appointed elders. And then he went back to Antioch in Syria, where they'd first been committed to the grace of God. And while they were there, some false teachers from Jerusalem arrived. Now, these weren't the Jews who refused to believe in Jesus. These were Jews who did believe that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But they said that Jesus wasn't enough. They said that, okay, you believe in Jesus, but now you must be circumcised. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses. So they added to the gospel of grace. This led later on to the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, where we get the apostles' um, letter saying, no, you don't have to be circumcised. So now we get to the why Paul was writing. He'd heard that these false teachers had also been to his churches in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and had been troubling the Galatian churches there, the ones that he'd founded. And they were troubling them, throwing them into confusion. They were losing their peace in Jesus. And he was shattered. The word here is, I'm astonished, I'm shattered, I'm downfounded, I'm gobsmacked. I can't believe you're doing it. Uh, that they were listening to these false teachers. And so quickly, it's probably only a year since they had first come to put their trust in Jesus. And they're deserting the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of God's grace, his goodness, his generosity, all the things he's given them. And that is the only good news that there is. So Paul is writing them, writing to them to get them back to their freedom in Christ. It's a, um, a subject that keeps coming up, freedom versus slavery, uh, liberty as opposed to bondage, uh, the law, works of the law rather than freedom in Christ, trying to live the Christian life by their own efforts. You really need to read the whole letter to get Paul's thing. It takes about 20 minutes if you read it aloud, probably less if you're reading it quietly. And some people have loved this letter. It's been called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty. Luther and Bunyan said it was their favorite books, and they loved it. But there are others who aren't quite so keen. They say that it's too emotional and too personal. We learn more about Paul in this letter than any of his other. The first two, first two chapters are all about him, his autobiography, and we're going to hear more about that uh, in the next session. Um, and it's too emotional. He uses words like astonished and perplexed, and I can't stand it, and this is awful, and I'm in agony over you, this sort of thing. And we try to keep emotion out of religion in this country. They say it's too intellectual. In chapters three and four, he goes into quite a doctrinal passage and explaining from the Old Testament, particularly from Abraham, who came 430 years before the law, to explain that it's all the promise of God, it's all the blessing of God. It's, it's, um, and it's quite difficult to follow these arguments. You might find you get stuck in chapters three and four as you try to work out what Paul is saying, but we'll be looking at those. But above all, people don't like the sense of controversy. It's too controversial for them. Uh, we love, in, at the moment, tact and tolerance. And you don't find much tact and tolerance here. I'm astonished. He calls them foolish at one time. You foolish Galatians, how can you be going back to the law when you've been set free? He says, who's bewitched you? Are you under a spell? Um, he really does go for it. You're either slave or free. There's no inclusivity here. You're in bondage or you're at liberty. It's either the cross or circumcision. He's fighting here for the truth of the gospel because he loves these people. He's founded these churches himself. He's gone through persecution with them. And he's gone through settling them and appointing elders. They are, as he says later, his dear children. In chapter 4, he speaks about them with such affection um, and of the time he had with them. 
He's fighting for the truth of gospel, of God's grace, his undeserved generosity shown in the death of Jesus on the cross. And to come and say, you've got to be circumcised. It does un undoes all that. If you add anything to the gospel, you're weakening it, you're undoing it. You're required to keep the whole law if you take that initial uh, step of circumcision, he says. You'll be alienated from Jesus. You'll have fallen from grace. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. If you take that step of circumcision, you've got to keep the whole law, not just the Ten Commandments, but all 613. And no one can do that. Now, this is what these false teachers were trying to do. They were trying to add to the gospel. They were saying, it's all right, you can believe in Jesus, but there's something more. Yes, it is God's grace, but there's something more. Yes, it's the gospel plus. Jesus and Christ crucified is what Paul preached. It's what Paul is writing about here. And living by his spirit and not by your own efforts. And there were two ways that these false teachers were attacking Paul himself, not just his message. They attacked the man as well as the message he was preaching. So Paul had to defend himself, both himself and the message. So we get in the beginning, it usually says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church in some way or other. But here we get Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are here with me. They're with me as well. They agree with this, all these brothers in Antioch. Because these people were saying, yes, I know dear Paul, he's got it a bit wrong. He's not really a true apostle. He wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. He didn't see Jesus after he'd risen from the dead. He's not really an apostle. He's, he's commissioned himself to come and give you this. Paul is saying, no, I was appointed directly by Jesus. When he met Jesus, or Jesus met him, should I say, on the road to Damascus, the message was, I'm going to send you as a light to the Gentiles to bring the light of the gospel to them. I am sending you. Jesus sent Paul with the gospel just as much as he sent the Peter, James, and John, and all the other disciples. I wasn't commissioned by a man. I didn't get it from any man. I got it directly from, from Jesus Christ and God the Father. Another thing in this gospel, you'll see he always talks about Jesus and God together in the same way that they had the same job, the same status. He's saying that Jesus is God who raised him from the dead. I didn't get my apostleship myself. I haven't appointed myself to this. Jesus did. And all the brothers who are here with me are in agreement with what I'm talking about. And then it's very interesting because it's the gospel that he's fighting for. He manages in the next three verses to get the whole of the gospel into a couple of sentences. Let me read it again to you. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So the first thing he says, we are trapped in an evil age, or a contemporary scene. We live, well, in our prayers, we were thinking about the awful evils that are going on in the world, just some of them, and there are more of them. God made the world good, but we have ruined it, and we are in an evil age. We handed our authority over creation and over life to Satan in the Garden of Eden when we obeyed him, listened to his word, rather than to God's. And this age is an evil age, and we desperately need to be rescued from it because this age is passing away. The world and its desires are passing away. And unless we're rescued out of it, we will pass away with it. And we need to be rescued. 
And God doesn't like this state of affairs. God longs to do the rescue. It's according to the will of God. God loved the world, so he gave his son. He wants us to be rescued from it. It's all God's plan. He thought it up. It's his desire. And he did it through Jesus' death on the cross, who died for our sins. That not, it wasn't just uh, an example of sacrificial love. It wasn't an example. He died for our sins to pay the penalty so that we could be forgiven. And he raised him from the dead which showed that the death of Jesus had worked and God's work of forgiveness was completed and finished. And the result of the gospel is grace and peace. He does it through grace. Oh, the generosity of God, we've been singing it today. Thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. The goodness of God is what started the gospel. And his grace goes on and on and on. Not only are we saved by grace, but we live by grace. And the result of this grace is peace. Peace with God, peace with others, and peace with ourselves. It's, the word shalom in Hebrew is far more, it's total harmony. Not the awful distortions and divisions that this world brings us. And all we need to do Take God at his word and say, yes, I believe you. You've done this for me. I am saved. I'm forgiven. It sounds too easy, doesn't it? it it's ridiculous. But that's the gospel. It is that easy that we accept the word of God. I love you. I want to give you this new life. And we accept it. Yes, we have to repent of our sins and believe in Jesus, but it is just... And later on, he goes on to say, this was the gospel that was preached to Abraham. Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. The moment he believed, he became righteous, clean, in God's sight. And that was the gospel that Paul preached. And that's the one he's fighting for throughout this gospel. Now, it's rather unusual in this, normally when Paul writes a letter, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus to the churches and somewhere, and then he says, I thank God for you because of this, or I praise God for this, or I'm praying for this. He always starts off with something positive before he goes on to deal with the situation that's causing him to write. Not here. <laughs> There's not a word of thanks, even to the Corinthians, where he was going to have to deal with, they were dividing into cliques, they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, they were condoning incest in the church, they were going to law against each other, they got the resurrection all wrong. There were so many things, yet he starts off, I thank God for the grace that he's given you. I thank you that you're not lacking in any spiritual gift. He starts, but not here. He can't. It is so much on his heart that these people are so quickly. I'm astonished. I'm flabbergasted. <sighs> yes, I'm dumb. I can't get over it. That you are deserting, changing sides, the one who called you by the grace of Christ. It's not just a doctrinal error or getting it theologically wrong. They're deserting the grace of God and therefore deserting the God of grace. It's all personal. It's not doctrinal. Are you trusting in God? Why are you wanting? It's so perfect, this gospel. God has done everything so well. Why on earth would you try to add anything to you? Anything to it. And you're deserting it. And you're turning to a different gospel that's no gospel at all. It's not good news. It's bad news. You're adding your own efforts to Jesus' cross. You're depending on self-righteousness, what I can do. And God loathes self-righteousness. He'd rather deal with sinners than self-righteous people. I've come to call the sinners, not the righteous, said Jesus. He was known as the friend of sinners. 
didn't get on at all with the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because they thought they were good in themselves. Just think of the story he tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee says, oh, I thank you, not like that man over there. I do this and I do that and I tithe my mouth. And it's wonderful. And the tax collector over in the corner just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he went home justified before God. And that's the gospel. We want mercy. Not to be given the judgment we do deserve, but to be given all the goodness of God that we don't deserve. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's fantastic. We should be excited about it. It's not just a, it's a totally different gospel. It's, uh, there are two words for other. There's, I will, when Jesus says, I will give you another counselor, he means another of the same sort. You're deserting and turning to another gospel of a totally different sort. And I was thinking, what is it? It's a bit like uh, these days we have these super duper detergents which tell us they'll make our whites whiter than white and all the rest of it. And we've got washing machines and we just put them in and it's all done for us. And it's deserting that and going back to a washboard where it's all your own work and you're having to scrub away and do things yourself. Then he says an extraordinary thing. If anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one we've preached, other than the one I preached to you and the one you received, then let them be accursed. It says here, let them be eternally condemned. Let, him, let, them, be da let them go to hell, is what he's saying, which is not a very polite thing to say and which is why some people sort of shrink back at this. But this is so important, because if they go on preaching this, they will be leading other people towards hell. And in case you haven't got how serious it is, I'm going to say it twice. If anyone, even an angel, should come to you and preach it, let them be accursed. And I think it's very important that we all know it doesn't matter who the person bringing the message is, whether they're a theologian, whether they're some famous leader, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what qualifications they have. The message is what is important. If their message fits with Paul's, then listen to them. If it doesn't, don't have anything to do with them. It's not the messenger and their qualifications that qualify, that... Um, I can't think of the word now, that validate the message. It's not the messenger. It's the message that validates the messenger. It's what they say, not who they are. Anybody, even if I come, if I'm caught out by these false teachers, then curse me as well. Then in verse 10, he goes on to say something else. I want you, Am I now still trying to win the approval of men? Or does this sound as though I'm trying to curry favor with men? Because one of the other things they were saying about him, he just wants to be popular. He's going to these gentlemen. He's saying, no, you don't need to be circumcised. No, he just want, he's pleasing people. He wants to make it easy, and he wants people to think well of him. Does that sound like I'm trying to be popular, he says? saying let people go to hell if they're not preaching the true gospel of God? No, he says, I'm a servant of Christ. Notice he says, if I was still trying to please men. We're going to hear later that he was a Pharisee, and we met the Pharisees in the Sermon on the Mount, who did their righteousness before men to be praised by men. It was very important for them that they were men-pleasers, that people thought, my word, what a holy man. Oh, what a good person. He said, no, I'm not like that anymore. I'm a slave of Christ. The only person I want to please is Christ. And if I have to use offensive language, I will do so because I'm fighting for the gospel. So there we have the introduction to this letter. The first two chapters are very personal, the next two chapters are very doctrinal, and then the last two are very practical, how to live this out. Because people were saying, well, if you don't have the law, people will be sinning all over the place. But he says, no, 
we will be given the gift of the Spirit to live through us and to live a life that is pleasing to God. He's desperate for the liberty of Christians for free. This series is called Faith, Believing, and Freedom, the Liberty of the Gospel. And it's the freedom not to sin. It's the freedom not to have to try. And you can it's a very narrow way that you have to walk. You can slip off this liberty, either by slipping into legalism, by people, giving people all sorts of rules and things they've got to do and things not to do, or by slipping into, I can do what I want, which is license. And there's this narrow thing of liberty between legalism and between license. And Paul's going to teach us how to walk that. And it really is through the Spirit, through the life of Jesus living in us, through the Spirit, that we can live lives that bring glory to God, which has been his motive all the way through, that God may be glorified. We got that in verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. I want God to be glorified, not me. <laughs> He's the one that we should be praising. He's the one that we should be pleasing. So here we are. There's a wonderful hymn that I love to sing at Easter. Uh, there is a green hill far away. But the last verse, I fear, has got it wrong. It says, oh, dearly, dearly have we loved, and we must love him too, and trust in his relieve, redeeming love, and try his works to do. And I think it should be not try his. We trust in his redeeming love all the way through. Uh, Paul says in Romans that the gospel is from faith from first to last, and it's grace from first to last. We start by believing in Jesus. We go on by trusting in Jesus. We go on by receiving his grace. The whole letter is about Jesus. I counted up, there are over 50 references to Jesus in just slightly more than six, five and a half pages. And Paul is saying, this is the gospel. It's the only gospel. It's the only way of righteousness. Not by own righteousness, but grace alone. There's nothing more that I can do for Jesus did it all, it says. It's not by works of righteousness. Jesus did it all on the cross. And that is the thing that keeps coming out. The cross is the offense. He says, if I'm going on preaching circumcision, then the offense of the cross has gone. The cross is wonderful news, but it's offensive. It's because it attacks our pride. I've said it before, there's nothing we can do to contribute to our salvation except the sin that we need to be saved from. We just believe God and say thank you. And it puts an end to human pride. We have met it again in the Sermon on the Mount, those people who turned up before Jesus and said, look, Lord, haven't we done this? Haven't we done that? Haven't we done the other? No. It hasn't Jesus done everything for me. There's nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Go on believing. Go on being saved. Faith from first to last. And that's what sets us free. Don't fall back into slavery. He's going to explain it more. But it's just wonderful, wonderful news. Let us at this time of Easter, when we've been celebrating the death and the resurrection to new life of Jesus, let's believe it and live that new life that he's given us. Amen.